really nice. Why do you guys say things like that? Because that always kiboshes things. It's all up to all of us. If we <laughs> run out early, it's up to us. Now? <laughs> <laughs> all Pamela? All what? the favors. We haven't all even called. Bye. Bye. The hearing. <laughs> Pam, let's go get those drinks. <laughs> the hearing. <laughs> Oh, I was gonna go to the. I was gonna go to my garden. My garden. Oh, I just picked asparagus from mine. Okay, it yeah. looks like we've settled down with who's coming in. So, um, I'm gonna start this meeting. Seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this regular meeting. I'm missing my thing. Regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 4:32 p.m. on April 6, 2023 pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. This meeting is also being recorded. At this time, I am now going to call the roll to make sure that each member can hear and be heard. Shalini. Present. Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Pam. Present. And Jennifer Taub is going to be late. We will mention when she comes in, we'll make sure we can hear her and she can be heard and we'll note the time when she does come in. So with that, um, our first item of business is public hearings. And so that, oh wait, I got two minutes till we can actually do it. Cause I said 4.35, so, so what Pat, is what? you're muted. That's all right. I was just fooling around. I was okay. saying that Chris Bestrup is a, a renowned singer. Maybe she'd entertain us. For <laughs> Instead of doing that, I will <laughs> note that while we're waiting for those two minutes, I did the front part too quickly, apparently. Um, minutes that it, we've passed for Pam's benefit. We passed the March 16 and March 30 minute le minutes last week. I just oh. haven't sent them to Athena and all, and they were passed without changes. Um, so I just haven't formalized that in terms of posting yet. Um, and the April 20th meeting minutes from last week are not ready yet. So we will yep. be postponing those to the next meeting. So that takes care of minutes. Um, basically there's no action. Um, hold on just a second. Yeah. So that they were approved on the 20th? On the 20th. Yeah. Okay. And have you already? I have not. It's on my list since you weren't there and I just haven't gotten around to it. There were no changes and I only have PDFs. So um, I'll, I'll take care of that and send it. To uh, thank you. Um, announcements. Basically, we might have more at the end, but um, the AMA, the joint meeting with the AMAHT will happen on March, not March, May. See, yeah. I do it too, Pat. Yeah. May 18th um, <laughs> at 7 p.m. Um, and Jennifer and I are meeting next week with um, Dave Zomek and Nate Malloy and the two co-chairs of the trust to go over sort of the schedule and plan for the meeting. Um, so that is, I, I thought I'd let that be known. Um, those are basically the announcements, unless anyone else has any other announcements. And if not, we will. I will pass the meeting on to Pam for public hearings. Thank you. She's just walking away. But Pam is going to run this part of the hearing, this part of the meeting, and it's public hearings. So the time is 4.35, and in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing of the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of pro providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw. I will read the paragraph of proposed changes. Zoning bylaw, Article 3, Use Regulations, Article 4, Development Methods, Article 9, Non-Conforming Lots, Uses and Structures, and Article 12, Definitions. 
to see if the town will vote to amend Article 3 use regulations to change the permitting requirements for owner occupied duplexes, affordable duplexes, non owner non owner occupied duplexes, converted dwellings and townhouses to create more streamlined permitting pathways for these uses to remove the use category quote subdividable dwellings to add a use category three family detached dwelling or triplex to add a permitting pathway and standards and conditions for triplexes to modify standards and conditions for other housing use categories to amend permitting requirements for housing use categories in the apple for recharge protection overlay district to amend article four development methods to add three family dwelling where appropriate to amend Article 9, non-conforming lots, uses, and structures, to add a reference to three-family dwelling, to amend Article 12 definitions, and to add three-family detached dwelling unit triplex, and finally, to delete subdividable dwelling. Um, I think the order here is to go back to the proponents of this, and ask what changes have been made and why, and give us an update. Go ahead, man. I'm going to share my screen because I think I did it without sharing last time and it got kind of confusing. So um, we tried to color code because everything has to stay in track changes um, because that's how you present the bylaw modification. So we tried to color code. Bright yellow is changes from the original proposal. And so you will see in the general um, two and three family detached dwelling general condition sort of, we have added um, a, oh, and, and before I get into this, I want to say that I want to thank um, Chris and Rob and Nate for meeting with Pat and I multiple times to work through the entire um, you know, the entire proposal, it is now, I, I would say it is now a little um, and, um, more compact, I would say. Oh, and Jennifer is now here. So yeah. Jennifer, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, I can hear you. Thank you. Um, I would say it's, it's more compact now. There is less changes going on and you will see that in here. Um, the Planning department asked that recommended that we put in this this bright yellow design standards for two and three family dwellings adopted through rules and regulations from the permit granting authority, um, and so that's one of the changes is it it expands on in some sense the design you know the design standards that are already you know this this part had design standards already required to be followed, um, and then this. Um, through other things, um, design review principles in section 3.24, it's already up here, but this would allow each of the permit granting authorities, um, Rob, the planning board and the zoning board of appeals to adopt design standards specific to two and three family dwellings um, that go into these areas. And the planning department thought that would be a good idea. And we said, fine with that. And so it's now part of this proposal. Um, the written decision is just a consolidation from the other sections into the general standards to apply for all. It happened to be in all of them. And so we just moved it up into that so it wasn't repeated three or four times. Um, I will come back to this teal section because that is the one area that um, the planning staff and Pat and I have different proposals basically on the table. Um, so I will talk about that section later. We have, if you look at the highlights here in yellow, the non-owner occupied duplexes, we have basically gone back to proposing almost no changes. Um, we had originally proposed site plan review for non-owner occupied duplexes. We are back to special permit in all of those areas. Um, they're in yellow now to show that they changed, but they would not, as you see, they're not tracked, which means that's what the current code is. The only change now that remains is allowing non-owner occupied duplexes in um, the aquifer recharge protection districts, um, which right now they're not allowed at all. And this would put them also by special permit, which means it would still be discretionary, but someone could apply to put one there. 
Um, this yellow change here is the section that needs to change. Um, it referred to the planning board section and now it goes back to referring to the ZBA section. So that's just a, a correction there. Affordable duplexes, the only change there is in the teal and I will come back to that. Uh, triplexes, we were in agreement to keep this section, but in keeping it, we have proposed instead of a lot of the site plan reviews we had proposed, and I think we had a special permit in the ROLD, um, we are proposing all special permits except in the ROLD where it would be a no. And these, per, these, these permitting pathways now nearly match what are um, currently, if you consider triplexes are currently permitted under townhomes or apartments, these categories now, these permitting pathways basically match what they would be under townhomes or apartments. Um, I think there's one or two differences, um, but in general, if it was allowed as a special permit in a townhome or an apartment, it is now being proposed to be allowed still just under a separate use category. Um, but the, so the big part of this one is sort of creating that separate use category, not necessarily making it easier to permit them through a change from a special permit to a site plan review. It's getting the use category into the bylaw. Townhomes you will see have most of the changes here are to take it back to the current bylaw of special permits or no. The only changes we are continuing to request are in the BG to move townhouses to special permit from site plan review. So this would actually make it harder, not easier to permit. Um, and in the RN, changing from a no to a special permit, if you remember from our original presentations in the RN, that is where we have most of our apartment complexes. Um, and so we believe that we should at least allow townhomes through discretionary permits there and that special permit in those areas that already have a lot of denser type building uses. Other than that, townhomes are not have not seen any changes since the original proposal. Converted dwellings have seen a lot of changes. It can be confusing to see how much is being removed and then things that are being added. All the yellow is a change. Um, in talking with the planning staff, we are trying with these proposals and these proposed new changes to bring converted dwellings back to a good differentiation between a converted dwelling and a new construction. Um, to really make converted dwellings the conversion of an existing building, whether that be an outbuilding or a residence that's getting converted from a one unit to two or three units, the building needs to exist and pretty much the entire construction has to be within the current building envelope. Um, and if you're not going to do that, if you're looking for a lot of additions to that building envelope, you need to be under the duplex, triplex, or apartment, townhome category, not this converted dwelling category. And so um, what is the new changes is deleting this section five, um, which had a lot of things about if you're going more than this, then you get extra this if you do this or you don't get that. It was very confusing. <laughs> Um, and so we're trying to sort of streamline it and bring it back to what the planning staff, particularly I think Rob said, was its original purpose was to deal with buildings that are already there that want to be changed to from a one family to a two or a three or a four family or from an outbuilding to a dwelling unit per se. So that's the basis for most of these changes. Um, there is still an, in, an increase allowed, but it's a standard one and it doesn't depend on X, Y, or Z that the one that was is there now does. A couple of other additional criteria um, that match more of the triplex, duplex criteria that are being added or proposed to be added to the bylaw. Uh, those are the changes other than the ones I told you I'd go back to, which is in teal, it's the same language for affordable duplexes and 
owner occupied duplexes. And this, this language is new. And what, what it's a result of or why it is here, no matter whether it's Chris's version and request or our request is our bylaw allows multiple principal uses on any one parcel. We've seen this a couple times, so I can have a single family home on my parcel, and then I can also build a second single family home on my parcel as long as all the dimensional tables are met. And they both can be principal uses. Uh, you can do that with duplexes, you can do that with apartment buildings. We actually see it a lot with apartment buildings. Um, if you look at some of the Puftons and larger apartment complexes, there's multiple buildings, they're all a principal use of apartments. Um, and the concern here was if we made and did change the zoning to a yes for owner occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes, that would mean that not just one duplex on a property would be permitted by a yes, but two, three, five, or six, depending on how large the parcel is, could be permitted by a yes. And all of us in those meetings recognize that that might not be good, even though you can do it, well, that might not be good. Um, and what Pat and I in our original proposal with the yes are trying to get that first building as the yes, right? We were thinking of when we were doing this proposal, a duplex on a piece of property, not five duplexes on a piece of property, but one duplex on a piece of property. So the teal basically recognizes that intent of Pat and I's by saying, if you're going to build one duplex on a parcel and it's going to be owner occupied, it's a yes. Or if it's going to be affordable, it's a yes just to the building commissioner. But once you get above that one duplex, that two units on that parcel, um, in the RO and RLD districts, you need a special permit. Uh, that is actually what we require right now in the RO and RLD for owner-occupied duplexes. If you look for affordable duplexes, it's a site plan review. Um, and so for RO, RLD, we're basically saying back to what the current if, if you're going more than one building or two units, we're not trying to change the zoning that we currently have. In the RG, RVC, and RN, we're saying the same thing, but it goes to site plan review, which matches in the RG and RVC, the current permitting pathway in both owner-occupied and affordable duplexes. And in the RN, it matches the affordable duplex pathway and, and eases, in a sense, the owner occupied duplex pathway. Uh, Chris will explain her reasoning. The only difference between what Chris is proposing and what Pat and I are proposing is when you get above four units on a property, more than four units on a property in the RG, RVC, and RN districts. Chris would like, would propose that that become a special permit, not a site plan review. And we are proposing- Andy, Andy excuse me. Can, why don't you finish and then I'm going to ask Chris to explain her changes rather than you trying to explain her changes. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just putting out what the difference would be. And that is we would keep it site plan review and Chris would move to a special permit at that above four units. It's why I kept this to the end, because then we can go to Chris to explain her reasoning. And we because that's all I wanted to say about anything. So do you want me to keep this up, Chris? You're muted. I think I would prefer it if someone would put up the memo that I wrote to the planning board and then go to the last page, bottom of the page. Let me get that open. And then I will put it up. And Chris, thank you for writing that. You're welcome. It was, it was very helpful to um, use your write-up as uh, sort of a reflection of the changes that were made, even though yes, they were yellow or yes, they were teal. So it was, it was very helpful. Okay, so shall I start? Yes, why don't you start? Huh? Okay, um, so the concern that we have in the planning department is regarding proliferation of um, different types of buildings, different types of uses on a property. And a long time ago, I'm going to say 10 years ago, which seems like a long time ago, I think it was about 10 years ago, um, town meeting 
uh, voted to treat owner occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes differently from um, non owner occupied duplexes. They voted to allow owner occupied and affordable duplexes in the RG and RVC zoning districts by site plan review. And at that time, that seemed like a very good idea. And it still seems like a good idea. But at that time, we were not looking at um, multiple principal uses on a property. And since then, our interpretation of um, Section 3.01 of the zoning bylaw has evolved to permit multiple principal uses on a property with the um, finding by the permit granting board that the uses are complementary. And I'm going to give you some examples of those uses. Um, at 32 Northampton Road, um, I think if you uh, go up just a bit on this um, on this memo up to the bottom of page three, uh, let's see. Yeah, there you go. So 32 North Prospect Street, rather, I'm sorry. 32 North Prospect Street is the old um, Hastings mansion. And um, someone bought that property and converted the main house into two dwelling units and then added four townhouses at the rear of the property. And we consider that to be a very successful um, development but it was carefully scrutinized by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that was allowing a duplex and four townhouses to exist on that property. And the Zoning Board you know, went through several iterations with the applicant and arrived at what you know, is generally considered to be a good, a good development. Um, the second one I wanted to tell you about is uh, 1147 North Pleasant Street, which is a property owned by a fellow named Michael Holden, who's a, a local builder. And he had a duplex on the property and he had a growing family and he wanted to um, add a single family house to that property. So uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals considered that application. The Planning Board also reviewed it and made recommendations to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the Zoning Board of Appeals eventually granted the special permit to allow the single family house to be built. There was enough lot area and he provided enough parking and the layout of the property seemed to be um, adequate. And so again, the Zoning Board of Appeals carefully considered all the aspects of it and, and approved that project for two types of principal uses on the same property. Um, 164, 174 Sunset Avenue is another example. And some of you have are very familiar with this since it's in your neighborhood. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals considered um, three non-owner non occupied duplexes and three apartment buildings um, for this property. This was proposed and it did go through the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and again, it went through several iterations and the final um, result seemed to be well regarded by those who participated in the in the process both the zoning board felt good about it and i believe that people in the neighborhood are feeling generally good about that process so those are examples of um, multiple types of principal uses on a property that were carefully considered by the zoning board um, the planning board has also done this and one bolt would place, which is that building that some people call the ice box behind Judy's was an example of this, the planning board um, making a finding that these two principal uses, Judy's restaurant and a mixed use building were complementary to each other. And that was in the downtown area in the BG zoning district where density is expected. So um, in, in kind of winding this up, I would say that the planning department is concerned about the proliferation of different uses on a single parcel without benefit of a special permit. We're already going to, uh, we're, we're taking a big step by saying that um, not that owner occupied duplexes can be a yes in every residential zoning district because in the past in many districts those were by special permit so now we're saying yes you can build an owner occupied duplex in all the residential districts but then do we want to see um a, a, here's a, an example of what could happen if we aren't really careful a developer could come in and say well i want to build a 
development of condominiums and I want um, duplexes for this condominium development and I want one of each one unit in each building to be owner occupied but the other doesn't need to be and this could be by site plan review with the proposal by the proponents in most zoning districts except for RO and RLD. So site plan review is a great um, process. It's the planning board's process, but the planning board, generally speaking, doesn't say no. They don't deny a permit. So when they're looking at um, whether something is appropriate, the, the default position is that, yes, this use is appropriate in this location. And the planning board is just going to tell you or help you to shape it, um, help you to decide how many parking spaces you need, where landscaping should go, what your lighting uh, plan is like, what the buildings look like. But they're not going to say no to the proposed use. Um, they also, there's no appeal period from uh, a, a planning board site plan review. So if neighbors object to what's being proposed, um, if the if the planning board has gone through the process correctly and they've, you know, met the zoning dimensional requirements, et cetera, there's very little chance that a, that a site plan review would be appealed. Um, the, the special permit process, on the other hand, does provide for an appeal period. Um, and it also allows the Zoning Board of Appeals to say no. They can say, no, we don't think this use is appropriate in this location. We think that you need to make it smaller or you need to not do it at all. And the Zoning Board rarely says no. I think they approve like 95% of the of the um, of special permit applications that come before them. But it's important to be able to say no if the, if the um, reviewing body doesn't think that it's an appropriate use in a location. So now if you can scroll down, then I'll talk about um, what we have proposed as language to replace the language in the teal. What we've proposed is to say that for owner-occupied duplexes um, in the RG, general residence, RVC, which is village center residence, and RN, residential neighborhood districts, any development with more than two, but no more than four dwelling units on a parcel would require site plan review. In other words, and again, this is a huge step from the way it is now, um, especially in the RN district. Um, we're saying that you can have one duplex on a property and that's fine, but if you have two duplexes on a property, that's four dwelling units, then you need site plan review in those districts. In the um, case where you might have more than four dwelling units, in other words, more than two duplexes on a property, and that's the next sentence in RG, RVC, and RN, any development with more than four dwelling units on a single parcel would require a special permit. So I think that's where we differ most from um, the proponent's uh, presentation. Um, the last sentence in this uh, section is essentially the same as what Mandy and Pat are proposing in the RO and RLD districts. We're also proposing the same language for affordable duplexes because, again, do we want um, a proliferation of as much as we love affordable housing? You know, we want to promote affordable housing, and the planning department works very hard to work with developers of affordable housing to provide more affordable housing in town. But I think what we don't want is a proliferation of affordable units. You know, not that it would happen. I'm not even sure it would happen, but um, kind of ad lib, willy nilly, whatever phrase you want to use. So we're proposing the same language for affordable duplexes as we propose for owner-occupied duplexes. And um, there is an argument to say that, well, in the RG and RVC zoning districts, um, you're already allowing owner-occupied duplexes by site plan review. And therefore, um, technically, if you were to uh, go before the planning board, you could have a proliferation of these things by site plan review. You could have 10 of them on a property um, by site plan review, because that's what the uh, zoning bylaw says right now. And, and I think that that is a, an unintended consequence of the change that we made 10 years ago. Um, and that combined with the fact that now we're 
loosening up to allow more than uh, one type of um, principal use on a property. So it's an unintended melding of those two things that would then allow <clears throat> a proliferation of duplexes. And we think that our language really makes sense. It controls things pretty well. It's still um, much more expansive than the current situation, in my opinion, and that it... Um, it's sort of, uh, it, it. all I'll say is it controls things better by putting things in the hands of the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that's, I guess that's my, that's my pitch. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was pretty clear. <laughs> um, I'm looking at, let's see, if we have um, any questions from this group, I, I would like at some point to take advantage of the um, of the folks in the audience. And we've heard we've heard this presentation several times, and I'm happy to have um, public comment. And we can do it now or before the we can do it before the counselors talk about it or um, after. But I, I, I'm I'm going to go with doing the um, questions from the audience. Why don't we do that right now? Are there any folks in the participant list? There are one, two, three, four, five people in the participant list. And this is a great opportunity to ask questions or express uh, ideas. So I'm gonna call Janet Keller right now and I don't have control. So I think Mandy has control over the... Um, can you hear me? Uh, Athena does. So. Oh, Athena yes, does. Can. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. Can you let Janet Keller in, please? Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to this um, uh, very important piece of uh, rezoning. Um, I can, could, cannot begin to parse, let alone speak about um, what has just been said. Um, but um, I do want to recap some of the things I said um, in the memo I sent to you today. And I, the, essentially, I'm saying that this is a huge amount of work that people have done. And I believe it is all done in good faith and good intentions. And I am left, however, with the impression that it won't produce affordable units. It hasn't, and it won't. And that there are things like inclusionary zoning, um, like working intensively with nonprofit um, CDCs, um that do work and um i further um am very very concerned about the um removal of a butter's notices and any opportunity for folks who have like me um taken their life's savings and put it into a house and then find um, something unsuitable proposed um, after the fact for next door. And they never get a chance to speak to that, to suggest changes um, and improvements to the plan um, and um, are essentially um, uh, foreclosed for any recourse um, would have, it wouldn't even know about it, let alone be able to speak to it or, or challenge it. Um, and and it, it just sprouts in their backyard and it sits there for generations. Um, so I, I, uh, I would really like to, 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 uh, encourage you to explore 
um, the methods that have worked and, and um, to extend inclusionary zoning to SPR, um, uh, there's, you know, um, yes. So it, I basically am saying that I thought a lot um, and I worked really hard over several days on, on these comments. And um, last night, I attended um, the meeting of uh, Valley CDC with their 30 units um, on uh, Ball Lane, which is, um, I, I, I can go down to the, to, to the corner of uh, my house, my, where I live, and I can um, throw a, a baseball over there. So it's very close to me. Um, I came there to support it to support those 30 ownership units. We're, we're very excited up here about that and um, looking forward to welcoming our new neighbors um, and sharing what we've learned um, living on um, at, at co-housing where we've got um, a pretty dense, um, as dense as my city house um, on the six acres where we've built. Um, but it's surrounded by uh, open space that, thank God it's there because we're beginning to farm it and to live off, literally live off the land. Um, so these are my thoughts. I, I really believe that um, zoning cannot conquer the upside down housing market um, here in in Amherst. Um, that requires other solutions, getting UMass to, to um, build units for its students. And, um, you know, I, I hear that you guys have worked really hard and I have respect for your work. Um, unfortunately, I think there are um, much better ways to go. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Janet. I see Ronnie Parker's hand up and would like to bring her in as well. Hi, um, this is Ronnie Parker. I am clearly not a housing expert and I've struggled with all of this stuff. Um, I hear at least I'm on the same page with the previous speaker in that I very much support affordable housing and believe we need a lot of it. Um, I still don't see how this is going to achieve that goal. Um, what I see still is that it is a way of bypassing existing regulations that protect people, abutters and others, um, and that the current regulations permit community-based problem solving through the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and these are being sort of displaced by placing decisions in the hand of one person. I still see that being really what's being achieved, and that doesn't give me confidence. I have seen the Zoning Board of Appeals at work. I really, really like how they help people solve, resolve differences. And so I guess I, I'm very much on the side of the uh, what the planning department has said in their presentation, which I did understand. And thank you so much uh, to the planning department for that. It felt like it was all in English. Um, I don't know what methods do work, but uh, because I don't have any expertise in this area, but I just heard what Janet Keller said, and I know she is an expert. And um, so, Clearly there are alternatives and my suggestion would be that is that we look at ways that will more um, carefully, that will assure us that we can get to the goal, which is affordable housing and not just more housing. So I think it seems like we've chosen more housing saying if we have more, some of it has to be affordable. I don't support that view. I support the view that we should target, do our research upfront, 
and ensure that we get affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Any else, anyone else in the audience uh, who would like to speak, raise your hand. And once once everyone has been um, has been able to speak, we'll come back to the, um, the committee. And if there are questions that any of us have, anyone else in the audience, raise your hand if you'd like to weigh in. Very welcome to do so. I'm not seeing any hands, um, so we will go back to um, the committee itself. Are there any questions or comments for um, what's been proposed so far? If nobody else has any, I have plenty. <laughs> Jennifer, good. We'll let you go first. Thank you. Um, okay, I had more a few comments. Um, I know you've heard me say this before, but I would, uh, you know, just kind of um, uh, express agreement for what Chris Brestrop and the planning department have said. I would like to see the um, permitting process that's currently in place maintained. And especially, well, I wouldn't say especially, I mean, I, I, I share the concern um, that some of the you know, uh, speakers just said that when it's to have many more um, different housing types or even some more just be a yes, it just, there, then there is, there's no, I mean, it's very important for abutters to be informed and it to be visible. And we don't always know who will be in a position, you know, in town government that will be making that decision. So I would, you know, very much, you know, like to express, you know, my support um, and desire to keep, you know, the permitting process as we have it in place. And especially with the site plan review um, that it, it, it because I mean, it provides a very careful review and it really gives the entire community a chance to be involved. And I guess because we just recently, I always refer to the, and I Chris, think Chris mentioned it, the 164 to 174 Sunset um, Avenue. And everybody is very, um, I, I really encourage everybody to come and look at that development. Some of the um, structures are now framed and it's, it, it went through a few iterations, but it really, um, it's looking like it fits in really well with the neighborhood and on the block. And the developer was very willing to actually have one-on-one -on -one conversations with residents. I mean, it really, um, I think, I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's a process that really isn't broken. And I know that, you know, sometimes it said, well, it will be less expensive for a developer if they don't have to go through the permitting process but I really think when a developer is spending multiple millions of dollars on a development, the few thousand, if it's that, that's spent on the permits is well worth what it gives to the final project. Um, the, new, the new housing complex, the public-private partnership with UMass, the Fieldstone complex, it's gonna open in September at Lincoln and Mass Avenue, because that was on university property, they did not have to go through any of the town of Amherst permitting process. And the rents they're charging are probably the highest in town. So the, they're not reflecting any a few thousand dollars or any amount of money that the developer incurred obtaining permits because there were no permits from the town involved, but that we're not seeing any lower rents. I mean, a developer, they're putting, you know, they're when they build these, whether it's a small development or a large one, they're going to charge what the market can bear unless it's you know, working with a partner and it's going to be affordable housing. So the few thousand dollars that they may have to spend on the permitting process, that's not what's driving the rents up. And I thought, you know, the Fieldstone is a perfect example of that. Um, so, and then I had another, but I had, I'll let other people go. I had another specific question about, but can I come back at the end so I can let somebody else sure. have a chance? Sure. Okay. Yep. Shalini. Yeah, I'm still processing all this and I think I need more time to process, but, uh, and maybe the answer is already there somewhere and I can see it. Um, 
how does one like if the difference between owner occupied duplex and non owner I understand the logic and makes sense, but how do we like once it's. Uh, how do we ensure that it stays owner occupied and what happens if it is not owner occupied like if you build it according to it was owner occupied and then it is not anymore what happens then. Andy or Christine which whoever wants to reply to that. I can reply. Um, so the building commissioner has the ability to enforce the bylaw. And if something is approved as an owner occupied um, duplex, then, and it becomes a non owner occupied duplex, he has the ability to enforce the, um, you know, what it, what it needs to be. It may take time and it may require, you know, going to court. Um, but he, he can deal with it. He has the power to deal with it. He may need some more inspectors on his staff to deal with um, a proliferation of owner-occupied duplexes if that were to come to pass. But I think that um, the CRC is working on a rental registration bylaw, which we hope will include the ability to have more inspectors on the uh, building commissioner's staff. So I believe that it can be enforced. What if already built more more according to the, you know, then does that allow for more or some something that you can't undo? Is that possible? Do you want me to answer that? Yes, please. So um, the building will be built, mm -hmm. but the management of it is what will be scrutinized. Um, in other words, if it turns into a non-owner occupied duplex, then it would need a special permit and it will have to go before the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Zoning Board of Appeals will review, you know, what's going on on the property. Does it need more parking? Does it need more um, lighting or, you know, whatever it needs? And then we'll scrutinize its parking plan, its management plan, et cetera. So they'll have to go through the process with the Zoning Board of Appeals if they choose to make it a non-owner occupied duplex. Okay, thank you. That's and I have another question. Yeah, no, can, I, can I clarify what Christine just said? So that is in the process of changing from, we might not know that it's changed from owner occupied to non owner occupied. When it is determined or identified that that ownership has changed, does that actually kick in the, um, the review by the building commissioner? May I answer that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the building commissioner doesn't, you know, drive around seeing who's violating the zoning bylaw. Um, to some degree, he relies on complaints. So if neighbors see that a formerly owner occupied duplex is now rented, if both units are rented, then someone can complain to the building commissioner and he will take action. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Shalini, why don't you finish? I, I interrupted that. No, 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 it was the same topic, so I'm glad you did. Okay, um, so my other question, uh, Chris, I'm trying to understand this, is when you give the example of the building behind Judy's and how the SPR, the site plan review, did not, you know, was insufficient, it sounded like, in in the, no, is that, is that not the point you were making? That S, the site no. plan review, no? That's not what I, I don't think I, I didn't mean to say that. Um, I was giving that as an example of a time when the planning board had to make a finding that the two uses were complementary. But then I said that this was in the downtown business district and the expectation is that there are all kinds of uses in the downtown that are very close to one another and it's very dense. So it made sense for the planning board to make that finding in that particular location. But to make similar findings for the planning board to make similar findings in outlying districts, I don't think is is as appropriate. In some cases, you know, I did say that if you have up to two, um, what did I say? Two mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. If you have more than two dwelling units on a property, I think the planning board can review mm -hmm. up to four dwelling units on a property, and that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I think it should go to special permit. Okay. And so I guess my question was, 
what I'm hearing you say is that the existing design and dimensional requirements that already exist, those would be insufficient to ensure that it is built in an appropriate or, or design guidelines or so is it yeah so the first question is can we have like in the design guidelines make sure that the that it's fitting into the neighborhood and then the existing dimensional requirements could those protect uh, and make sure that the development that happens is as expected uh, for that area you want me to answer that? Yeah, yeah Chris. So um, all of these things help to protect the area, the dimensional guidelines and the permitting process. So everything works together. Um, mm -hmm. There are cases where dimensional guidelines may allow more dwelling units to be built on a property, but for various reasons for that particular mm -hmm. location, you wouldn't want to maximize the number of dwelling units or the maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage, you might want to pull back from that. Um, design guidelines will help, but design guidelines don't relate to management of the property. So you mm -hmm. can, excuse me, my phone is ringing. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, um, you know, what am I trying to say now? I'm distracted by my phone. But mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get at is there are multiple layers of things that make a property and a project suitable for the neighborhood. Management plan, you know, um, dimensional requirements. If we had design guidelines for these types of uses, that would help. But design guidelines aren't going to make the uh, management of the property work better. So you need the management plan as well. So it's it's all these different things working together. And I, I think it's really um, helpful to have these projects come before either the planning board, if they're small enough and have a, a minor enough impact, or the zoning board of appeals, if they're bigger and they have a more major impact. I think that's, um, that's a good thing. And it's not something to be um, shied away from. Okay, and the last clarifying question around this is, uh, uh, so you said like the planning board does ask for parking and what it's going to look like and all of those things. So, but it doesn't ask for the management plan. Is that like, is that the difference? Between no, the planning board asks for the management plan, but the planning board can't say no, unless they have a very clear reason that if the project doesn't adhere to the zoning bylaw, they can say no. If the applicant hasn't produced the the correct submittal requirements they can say no but if they um if the project fits within the zoning dimensional requirements and fits within the use requirements they're 99 percent likely to say yes and then there's no appeal process so it's it's a lesser it's it's really saying this type of use is something that the town wants in this location whereas the zoning board of appeals special permit says this type of use may be something that we want in this location, but we want to be able to really control it, scrutinize it, and look at it carefully. That's all. All right. So to me, I think for the committee, what we are looking at is like we have it's more like how much control do we want in the sense that it it sounds like we have dimension, like the planning board can ask for dimension, you know, it has to adhere to the dimensional, it has to adhere to the management plan and the parking and all of these things. So the planning board, it sounds like can ask for, can say no, as long as you don't adhere to these things, we're not going to approve it. However, what I'm hearing is that all of that is not enough, that we still need uh, an appeal period after all of those layers of things that are in place. Christine. Like it's not nothing, it's not nothing, right? It's not like, oh, if we don't have the ability to say no, anything can come up. It, I mean, it's not that, right? We have dimensional guidelines. We have, they have to have the design. They have to meet the parking. They have to, like, there are all these things in place. And so the planning board can say no at any of these points till the client or developer does that, right? If the project meets the zoning requirements, then mm -hmm. the planning board really isn't going to say no. 
but if there has to be some particular thing that they're not adhering to yeah like a parking it is, no. uh -huh. so they can say no if the it's not adhering to the parking requirements let's say mm -hmm. it can so it yeah okay so it's only how much level of safety do we want in our town to allow for mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you um mandy oops so a couple of questions for chris um we've heard some comments from the public about we should tackle particularly affordable state state housing, subsidized housing inventory, affordable housing through the IZ inclusionary zoning bylaw, um, including uh, one comment today that was, we need to make it apply to more than just special permits. Um, Christine, can you clarify that the last amendment that the council did about two years ago, did that such that all developments that add 10 or more units whether they go through the special permit or the site plan review process are required to comply with our inclusionary zoning bylaw now. Isn't that correct? May I? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yes, you're right. Um, our latest inclusionary zoning bylaw, which was adopted in the spring of 2018, I believe, applies to all um, residential developments over 10 units except for um, standard uh, subdivisions and um, cluster subdivisions, but otherwise it um, it applies to all residential developments. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my next question is, am I correct in saying that um, your proposal or the planning staff's proposal regarding the RG, RVC, and RN districts for owner-occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes um when there are more than four dwelling units on a parcel is actually a change to the current permitting process because the current permitting process is site plan review for affordable duplexes in all three of those areas and you're saying it should be special permit and for owner occupied duplexes in two of those three areas it is site plan review right now and you're asking for it to go to special permit so you're actually asking for a change in those sections from what we have now to make it harder to build and discretionary to build in an area where our town has already said multiple units on those parcels is a type of use we want in those areas of town. I would that say correct? that, uh, may I? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, I would say that um, it is not generally known that um, the that more than one type or more than one principal use is allowed on a property. It's kind of an unintended consequence of having adopted um, owner occupied duplexes by site plan review 10 years ago and then more recently um, allowing multiple principal uses on a property um, with a finding that the two uses are complementary. So those are two things that have been, uh, that have evolved. Um, I'm not sure that they've evolved together, but um, I don't think it was ever the intent when town meeting decided to allow owner occupied duplexes by site plan review that there would be multiple ones by site plan review. I think that um, nobody envisioned that at the time. Can, can I ask a clarifying question? When you say multiple principal uses, all of your examples in your memo were different uses, townhouse and duplex, single family home and duplex. If you build two single family homes on a property, do you consider that multiple principal uses or is that because they're the same thing, the same principal use? No, it, it, it's um, multiple principal uses would be two single family homes on a property, two duplexes on a property, two apartment buildings on a property. And the example that you gave about Puffton Village, that was approved, you know, many years ago, many decades ago, when that type of development was allowed in that particular zoning district, it's no longer allowed. But if you wanted to have um, two apartment buildings on a property now, you would need to have a special permit. 
Not in all districts, though. We allow apartments by site plan review in the RVC. RVC, yes, yeah. you're right. And so two apartment buildings in the RVC or a Puffton in the RVC, when you're looking at more than one apartment building, has actually been contemplated for a long time in our zoning bylaw on a single parcel. And some, and at least four or five, the two years ago when we did that change in apartments in the RVC and when we did mixed use buildings there, we've contemplated multiple principal uses on parcels for a very long time. I don't, I don't think we were long. imagining um, multiple apartment buildings on properties in the RVC when we made that change. That wasn't something that ever came up. So, um, you know, that's an un unresolved issue, unknown issue. The building commissioner is here. You could ask him, but um, I don't think that that was contemplated at the time. It may be approvable now. And as you say, um, multiple owner-occupied duplexes may be approvable in RG and RVC now, but I don't think that was contemplated as a possibility when owner-occupied duplexes were allowed by site plan review, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, I'm sitting here wrestling with a, a lot of the language that has been used. And so my questions are um, kind of swirling. Um, we've talked about as a community, making ourselves more available to uh, socioeconomic differences. We've talked about wanting to draw young families into the house, into the house, into our house, into our community. Um, and I, I'm really kind of struggling with terms that have been used. And I don't think that there's any um, ill intention in using the language, but it's language that I would like us to really think about. Uh, some of it is the idea of protection, affordability, proliferation, I'm, I'm really struggling with what we're wanting because zoning, as we know, has been used to keep people out or controlled. And I'm trying to figure out why, why it's okay to have uh, design guidelines that then when developers build bunkers in downtown and call them apartments they're really dorms why that got through how did it how did it affect the it positively affect housing and the other question that's swirling that nobody's answered yet we've talked about uh umass has been if they would just build more housing we wouldn't have a problem. All of a sudden, the people who are making tons of money, whether they rent to families or students or graduate students or professionals, they're charging the same rent. And we're losing families like Tashina Bowman. So, uh, you know, who's ready to buy a home and can't find a home here. So I don't understand. And I guess I would like you to tell me, any of you, all of you, Mandy, anybody, how the what you've been controlling has led us, how it's going to change the economics of our society. How is it going to change rents in Amherst? And I really want a, an answer to that because it's used all the time. And, and nobody really addresses it. So that's kind of where I am. I have more logical and um poignant but not poignant i think i'm i'm really scared because i i've seen so much resistance to socioeconomic difference in our community since the, since before i was on the council but be, being on the council brought it home in a really depthful way and none of you are really addressing that what you're addressing is what you want to protect and that's, I, I just somehow or other, how are you going to change the economics of the American culture? I really want an answer. How does this 
make it better for the average family? I'm going to let Christine answer that. You all should answer it because I need multiple answers. It's complex. Well, I want to say that um, Amherst was very resistant for years to building more housing. And it's only in the last, you know, 10 years, five or 10 years that we've really um, sought more housing. We've had the housing production plan done. We had the housing market study done. We have um, changed our inclusionary zoning bylaw, which wasn't working, and now it's working very well. Um, we are constantly working with Valley CDC uh, wayfinders and other um, entities that are um, people who build affordable housing and trying to attract them to town. We had um, the development in North Amherst at the Mill District where we have 130 units, but 26 of them are affordable at very low rates. Um, we have the building going up on Northampton Road that's 28 units of affordable housing all below 80%, some below 30 and some below 50. So we have a lot of development going on. We have, um, we have 800 units that have been produced in the last six years. And some of them have been single family houses, some have been in apartments, some have been duplexes, but that's a huge number. We have 9,000 something altogether, but to have 800 built in six years is huge. Um, in addition to that, I want to say that we have a master plan, and our master plan says to focus development in the downtown and the village centers, and I think that's what we're trying to do. We don't. I personally, and I think many people in town, like Amherst the way it is laid out. We like driving along Northeast Street and seeing the beautiful farmland in the Pelham Hills. We like driving along Bay Road and experiencing the open space. So the development that we're um, promoting is development in downtown village centers and also through your uh, change in the zoning bylaw, you're going to be allowing um, duplexes in outlying zoning districts like Echo Hill. Duplexes in Echo Hill have never been a thing, you know? Um, we, uh, and so they may, they, may be, they may become something and that's going to change um, the face of Amherst. That's going to densify already developed areas, which is what we say we want. The master plan says we want to focus development in already developed areas. So I think that that's a good thing. Um, but to talk about having a lot of housing in these places that we love, these um, you know, open spaces and forest land and farms and, you know, outlying areas. We really don't want that. We don't want to turn into northern New Jersey or northern Virginia or Long Island. We want to um, have our development shaped. And so by focusing it in already developed areas, downtown village centers and places like Echo Hill or other, you know, Orchard Valley, other developments like that, that makes sense. So I think that I agree with many of the aspects of your uh, proposal. I agree with um, allowing duplexes by right. I agree with um, creating a triplex that can be built in many locations. I agree with almost all of the things that you're proposing. The things that I don't agree with, I've tried to make very clear. But I do think that we have we have a responsibility to um, I don't know, protect our, and you don't like the word protect, but I think that's a good word, protect Sometimes our outlying like areas that we like to go and hike in. What if we had uh, houses all over the place and we didn't have any trails and open space that we could hike in and, you know, beautiful vistas that we could look at. So I think that the way Amherst develops is really good. And the fact that we, we've added 800 dwelling units out of 9,000 dwelling units, in the last six years is really good. And we are continuing to promote that. I can list on, you know, probably two hands and maybe three hands, um, all of the developments that are either under construction now or coming through the pipeline now, and they're all gonna provide more housing for Amherst, has, including affordable housing. How has that affected rents? What will it, or property costs? 
So, you, you know, you're saying we're not going to affect it, but you're not, a, we still, as you, the you is multiple people. It's not you, Chris. It's not, it, we, are, we cannot do that. The rents are going to stay high unless there's some major crash. And you know that. So why, I, so address that somehow. All of you need to think about how are you going to really address that? And you can't, given our society. And, you know, you know, Michelle Wu is failing, but hey, maybe, maybe that will be different. Um, so, Pat, I need to, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, go ahead, Pam. I'm, I'm going to take a very quick stab at that and then go to my question. Um, everyone is aware that there is a, a national trend to invest in real estate as, a, as an investment tool, as, a, as an alternate investment for their money. And the, those towns that happen to have colleges and universities have a big target on their back as a guaranteed money, you know, money back, guaranteed income flow. Um, rate of return is really high. It is, it is what drives that market. And we are the sweet spot of that. So when you have a university that can't house all of its students, you have a small community, the pressure to the pressure to raise rent is 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 something that many people can't resist. Let's put it that way. Many of the people who own the properties do not live in Amherst. They do not have the same concerns that were just expressed. So they have absolutely no qualms about raising the rent because there will always be somebody needing a place to live as close to campus as they can. And that is something that you and I cannot control unless it is to somehow make sure that no more housing is made available to, um, I'll just say to not, made available to students that are, that are complicating the the factors so I'm, that's not a not a complete answer obviously but it is so much economically driven that you and I have a really hard time you know combating um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the comments um, by the planning staff <clears throat> and and I um, I am really glad I have made all kinds of notes about the number of units on a property. And I think um, I'm comfortable with the number that the that the plan staff put out there as a as a possible uh, alternative to what was proposed by the, the, the counselors and having it a limit of four units on a particular parcel before it goes to site plan. Um, excuse me, to before it flips over to become a special permit. And I think the reason I would like to support that is because one or two buildings on a property can typically be done fairly, fairly handily. The number of people on the property um, can be managed parking wise, open space wise. Once you get above four units, we're actually we're actually in the same league now as townhouses and apartments. And so for that reason, I think we also need to consider in this in this conversation our uh, footnote M. And footnote M references specifically townhouses and apartments. What I think is the intention of footnote M is that it is the number of units on a on a property, not necessarily the type of housing, you know, the houses in a row or the houses in a block. It's really the number of units that we're talking about. And I would like to see reference in the same in the same section that given our propensity and and the ability to allow multiple principal uses on a property. I think the the Fearing Street, what is it? Um, the recent one, 78 or 98 Fearing Street. It's 164 to 174. 
that's so how it is. Thinking of the one that the one that's recent um, that was looking at there's a three family in the front and they were proposing two or three buildings in the back. Oh, oh I'm sorry, 98 Fearing. Yeah. 98. Okay. So 98 Fearing is another example of exactly what was being discussed here. That um, I I would like to see that. I don't, I don't know if it fits on that property with sufficient elbow room and screening for the neighbors. And I would like very much to consider the, the, um, the application of footnote M essentially to um, more than five, more, five or more units on a property triggering footnote M. So that's just something I wanted to put out there, but in, in general support the idea of switching over from site plan review to special permit um, after the addition of four units, up to after the addition of four units. So Jennifer and then and then Mandy. Oh, and also before I sorry, um, I was uh, I think we're we're not going to have time today to go through line by line or section by section of this. And I think I would encourage people to write out very specifically what their concerns or issues might be with each and every one of the sections uh, and the text that's there. That's what I'm going to plan to do because I don't want to just talk it through, you know, and take everybody's time here. So, Jennifer. Yeah, I really wanted to respond to Pat because I I am with you on that. Like, what can we do to make the housing more affordable and I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I know so with that, again, the sun, the townhouses going up on the corner of Fearing and Sunset, which where the neighborhood had a really good experience with it going through the ZBA, but the point of the Z, it, the, the, there was no resistance to that. The neighbors were very welcoming of that, you know, multifamily development and actually thought it would be an, an improvement <laughs> to what was, in that spot before, because frankly, there were two really derelict houses that the kind of houses that were being rented to students that students shouldn't have to live in, they were not in good shape. And, you know, what we kept saying to the developer and the developer was very receptive that we would love for that to be homes for families, retirees, workers at UMass. I mean, what can we do to make that happen? And part of what we did, you know, and the developer again was very receptive. There's literally going to be barbecues and there's going to be, they reconfigured how the units are on the lot so that they could have a playground. I mean, really making this a place where it could be a place that lots, you know, students would live there and, you know, it, it could be a community for many different people. And I mean, I'm telling you the community welcome this. But where I get scared is they, a question was asked by one of the um, members of the ZBA during, you know, the, you know, when they were reviewing the application of what would the rents be? And the applicant's representative said there'll be market rate rents and those rents are really high. So I don't know what, you know, and it had nothing, you know, um, I think, and this was over maybe a year ago, they said that the four bedroom units would, could go from 43 to 4,500 you know, that's really beyond what a family could afford. So I don't know what the answer is. I know that, you know, we, and again, because this development is happening in a district that's already zoned for multifamily housing. So that's not even, that's not a change for anybody in, in that area. But I don't know how, how you solve it because market rates are just so high. And I find it as frustrating as you do. <laughs> so I, I don't know. That's it. <laughs> Man, oh, okay, thank you. Mandy Joe. Oh, Chris, excuse me. Do you want to add something to that conversation or do you want to? I just wanted to note that the development at 164, 174 Sunset Avenue does include affordable units. And I don't remember if it's two units or three units, but they two. are going to two units. So it'll be um, two units at 80% or lower of area median income. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Andy. Oh, can I just say, I just wanted to add, I'm sorry, I'm not faulting the development. I mean, they're at market rate. It's just that market rate for the reasons Pam went over is so high in Amherst. It's, it's unusually high, I think, 
for the area because of the factors you've discussed. Andy. Thank you. Um, another question for Chris. Uh, you stated today that um, the master plan wants to focus development in the downtown and village centers. In fact, there is also an objective that says increase the opportunities for its objective eight. H3, increase the opportunity for infill development and the location of housing developments near services. Um, and a strategy is to revise the zoning regulations to promote infill development in strategic locations. And another strategy is to increase residential densities in the downtown and village centers. As a part of a different objective, um, the master plan says to reduce or eliminate lot size requirements differences for one and two family homes. Um, another strategy, H1F, specifically says allow two family houses by right in all residential zoning districts. Um, and that was under objective H1, encourage a greater mix of housing types, sizes, and prices serving a wider range of income levels than is currently available throughout Amherst and encourage the development of economically diverse neighborhoods. That's all from the master plan quoted. Um, and you said that you, you and you said today that you want to focus development in downtown and village centers. And so I'm, I'm going back to your over four units for special permit, um, which is not what's required now. And particularly in the RG and RV seats, which is village center and the residence general, which is only located within walking distance of our downtown. Um, RVCs are by definition the village center residential neighborhoods. And so given those objectives and strategies from the master plan, how does restricting the zoning of even further from site plan review to special permit of duplexes um, when you get above four dwelling units on a parcel support those strategies because I'm really having a trouble understanding how that proposal supports our master plan, including all of the objectives and strategies I just read because it makes it more difficult to, com to, to infill development near our downtown and village centers. So I hope you can answer that. I don't think it really does make it more difficult. I think it just helps to control how it happens and how big it is and um, how it's managed. And it's just um, what you're proposing in your entire proposal is huge. You're proposing to allow owner occupied duplexes in all residential zoning districts everywhere in town. And I think that's okay. Um, but when you start to get over a certain number on a parcel, I think that's when it needs to be really more closely scrutinized. And although I said I mentioned downtown and village centers, I also mentioned neighborhoods like Echo Hill and Orchard Valley and other subdivisions throughout town. Your uh, proposal would allow um, du duplexes on, on properties in those neighborhoods without any kind of um, public process. And I can go along with that. And what I would propose is that when you have more than two um, dwelling units in a, in a location, then in, in more than two duplexes in a location that you switch to a special permit. And I understand your point that you say, well, it's already allowed to have multiple duplexes on a property in RVC and RG um, by site plan review, but I don't think that that ever has been put to the test. Nobody's ever tried to do it. And it's um, something that is possibly if it started to happen and started to happen multiple times, people would be aghast, I think. And so um, my proposal just um, kind of reins in what you're proposing and you're proposing some pretty big changes, but just reins it in a little bit to make it more um, adaptable. 
So I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave now because I have a Zoning Board of Appeals meeting starting at 6. Um, but thank you very much for hearing me today, and I appreciate it, and I look forward to a continued conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I hope you get thank some you, dinner. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and I, you, oh, he hasn't left. Um, I'm, he did. He did leave. Okay. <laughs> I was, I was going to suggest that we, in fact, continue this hearing because it's not going to wrap up today. Um, so thanks to Chris for, for those contributions. I was going to actually reply to Mandy's question, and I think um, as you were reading the master plan sections, they talk about duplexes or whatever. And I and I, I'm pretty sure thinking back to that process and thinking about participating in all of the master plan production, that when someone says a, a duplex on a property, that's exactly what they envision. They envision one building with two units in it, and I think given our given our um, our ability now to do multiple um, principal uses on a site that it, it's a very different can of worms and I and I and I really do agree with, with her suggestion that that at four units or more than more than two duplexes or a triplex in a single family at at that point there are a lot of other management things. There's there's runoff. There's you know there's just a whole lot of other things that start to get in the in the mix. That I I am actually really pleased to hear her say something about then go to then go to site special permit. So anyway, um, do you want to do you want to make any other comments, Mandy? Uh I had some follow-up questions for Chris, but they can wait. Um, and then once Pat does, I, I can give you an idea of what happened at planning board, and then maybe we can make a motion. Okay, great, Pat. I just want to say that we keep talking about multiple principal uses. It's all about having housing for people. It's not multiple uses. Yes, I know some people would earn money from rents, et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking about housing for people and of a range of people, so. Yeah. Mandy, how about- If I may, the planning board continued their hearing to May 3rd, um, and their plan is to, it sounded like their plan is to only talk about the duplex sections um, on May 3rd, not any other part of the proposal. Um, and then I guess at a different date, they would talk about some other section or sections. I don't know how they intend to split it up. Um, listening to our conversation, we might be able to work our way through them less than that, in, in less time than their split sections. I don't know. As long as we go through sections, I'm not sure we have to yeah. specify specific sections. Um, I have asked as an update that kind of relates to what date we would wish to continue this to. Um, I have asked and sent off the um, permitting, residential rental permitting bylaw and regulations as they stood after last week's meeting with the amendments we talked about, sort of a cleaned up copy of that to Paul to send off to the town attorney. And I asked for that back comments back in time for the May 11th meeting. He thought that would be possible. Um, I have no idea, but that may, you know, and so if we get them back in time for the May 11th meeting, it would be wonderful to be able to do that on May 11th. Um, but <laughs> you never know whether we will, which makes it hard to set a hearing date, but I thought I'd put that out there. Our next meeting is May 11th, and then we have one May 25th. The week in between is the special meeting with the AMAHT. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what this committee thinks would be best to do to put this hearing on. I I would be I would be okay with continuing it to May 25, since it sounds like um, would we run into problems if if KP Law doesn't get the um, their findings back in, to us in time. If they don't, I think I would fill the meeting with the nuisance bylaw, which probably could fill a meeting. 
frankly. <laughs> um, but that's probably what I would do. But then we would, we, we would, this is why I'm not sure what the best is, because then I'd probably want to put the permitting on the 25th. I, I guess one option would be to put it on the 11th, but um, maybe a little later, just in case, you know, instead of a 435, so it's not first, put it at like 530 or something. So we might be able to do the permitting first if we have it. Um, or we could put it at 430, hold it. But if we've got the permitting, we could aim to continue the hearing a little earlier than the whole meeting. Like, you know. So um, let me make sure I understood that. So rather than targeting May 11th, just in case KP law takes takes time, we could target, we could make a motion to extend, to continue this to May 25. And we could either pick the beginning of the meeting or the middle of the meeting. Um, I think I was actually saying pick May 11th. Um, but if we have KP laws stuff back by then, we hold a shorter hearing on the 11th with an aim to continue the hearing to the 25th so that we could deal with the KP law stuff on the 11th also and give it enough time, maybe. Okay, so I'm gonna make a motion. I, yeah, I'm gonna make I, a motion. I think our goal as a committee is to try and get the permitting done without extending it unnecessarily. <laughs> I think we're kind of ready. Um, but. I'd like to make a motion then to uh, continue this hearing to May 11th. And um, uh, I'm Second. Gonna, <laughs> uh, I don't have a specific time in mind. You you were thinking Just put 435. 435. Let me, we have a second. Um, let's take a vote, Pat. Aye. Mandy. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. Where did Shalini go? I'm here. Yes. Oh, okay. I couldn't see you anymore. I'm sorry. I just, yep. Yeah. And yeah. Pam is aye. So that's unanimous. Okay. So I'm, the, the public hearing has been closed and um, I turn the reins back over to Mandy Jo. Thank you. Um, Next up is it, the planning board and ZBA appointment recommendations um, with an, uh, I, I had sufficiency of applicant pool on here. Um, I did not pull it because, you know, I'm always hopeful, but um, I'll just give an update and we can decide what we're going to do. Um, at this point for planning board, all current planning board members have been contacted to say that and told that they would have to submit a new CAF. I have not followed up with that contact, but they've gotten one email. Um, we've done, as I noted at the council meeting, an in the news sort of news announcement about both of these openings. So that went out and all individuals who had submitted CAFs within the last two years for the policy of the council have also been contacted telling them they have to submit a new one. At this time, we have four applications for three vacancies. On the planning board. The, on the planning the board. board. That's the planning board. Um, on the ZBA, um, Pam, do you want to do that? Do you have it up or do you want me to just do that too? Um, well, I'll just say that I have not contacted anyone um, to confirm interest that is currently on the on the ZBA. I have not taken that step. Okay. Um, we have right now, so ZBA has two full member and four associate member um, impending vacancies. Currently we have three applications. Um, for all six? For those six, yes. So again, again, I have not, I have not contacted all the current members to ask if they want to reapply. And I can do that. Yeah, I can get that done tonight. <laughs> yeah, I, I think if you haven't done the, the, the calf people too, you need to do those too. So, so 
the people who submitted CAFs in the last two years, CAFs oh, in the last right, two years right. under the policy, everyone plus the current members yeah. need contacted. Um, so given those numbers, I believe we should wait at least to the next meeting before we make our, before we actually consider and discuss sufficiency for both of them. Yeah. Um, and we but, just really made the point to the council this week for counselors to get the word out, so. Again, I, I, I had emailed them. <laughs> well, I've been putting it on every time I correspond with my district, I say, but it clearly it is not working. <laughs> right, None of that yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about ZBA is Chris Brestrup contacted me and said she wanted to meet with me and some of the planning staff regarding the ZBA appointments in particular as it relates to hearings and continuing memberships and what do we do about that because there will be some ZBA hearings that are long hearings that bridge the current term and the new term. Um, I've brought Pam into that conversation. We are in the middle of scheduling that meeting to talk about it. Um, normally we have worked with Maureen um, Pollock in the past who has been the ZBA reference in and for example our past practice has been to ensure that um, any ZBA member who is currently sitting on a hearing on June 30th for hearings that have started, um, even if they're not interested in continuing on or do not get reappointed for a full term or whatever, get their terms extended specifically for those hearings. Um, so that has been our past practice. Um, Chris may or may not be aware of that, uh, but she asked for a meeting because she has not been the ZBA uh, yeah. liaison uh, in the past, but we will certainly let that know and we'll keep you guys all updated on if things might change or, or what the issues are, but I thought I'd let you know that I brought Pam into that since Pam tends to do all of the communications for this one. <laughs> so. Any other questions on ZBA or and planning board? See none. The next is the engagement report. Um, we made great progress on this last week, um, but we were missing one member and it was a mess what we were looking at. So we had decided to clean it up and ask for any final changes to it before we vote before we take a motion to potentially adopt the engagement report or whatever the title of it is. I'm sure I've got a title here some way, somewhere, the Amherst Rental Survey Community Engagement Report. Um, so that went into your packets last Friday, I believe. Um, so I think at this time, if there are any additional changes people would like, um, please, speak up now, otherwise I'll make a motion. You're muted, Jennifer. I was, I was on my report page. Um, Did, oh, can I talk? I realized I just yes. blurted it out. <laughs> no, yeah, you can. I I <laughs> oh boy. Um, no, so Pam, what we were just, I guess what we were still, we hadn't quite, it was a section of the executive summary. I think we were, oh, again, it was occupancy. Because I think when Pam left off, she had put up a proposal where we had, um, I think, taken out two paragraphs and now they're they were put back in and i still had a concern so i'm now looking at i guess it's page seven section five under you know again the key issues concerning occupancy that i would just request that under negative consequences for students if the word in the second line discriminatory could be changed to unfair or let's see felt it described it as some described the four tenant limit as unfair 
because it doesn't allow them to live with more of their friends and partners or something like that. I'm just gonna type it in so people can see something like that, Jennifer. Oh, you're muted again. I'm sorry, I just had to sign back on. My computer's been doing something wonky where when you put a, a text up like this, it, the screen freezes. So I'm sorry, so I just sure. missed the last like minute. So I, I'm putting it up here so people can see. Is that is that something like the change you're requesting? Yeah, let's see. Some tenants described it as um, being unfair. That's unfair. So that's that's an okay change in terms of what you're requesting. This would be okay language. I'm having trouble seeing it. Um, I guess if the light so, print described it as being unfair for students who wanted to live with more of their friends and partners than the limit permits yes okay so thoughts on that request pam yes or i think i think that's actually a, a good solution um if you if you want to think about a tenant um cap it's unfair it it it, it would be as discriminatory against um um you know people who work together living in the house as it would be for students. So it, we, it's not discriminating against students. The word discrimination is a very, you know, legal description. So I, unfair is, is really what it's talking about. I like that. Pat, and you're muted, Pat. Sorry, uh, I said this before and I will say it again. This is language that came from the survey. It was language used by students. You're saying that it's okay to change their language. Uh, maybe I then want to go through and change some of the um, neighbors or language. And I don't because they said what they said. The other thing is we are discriminating against students because we are not discriminating against a family of six or seven that's renting a two bedroom home. We're not discriminating against people in an apartment complex where there it's a two bedroom and there are four or five people living there. We are targeting students and good or bad, no judgment on targeting students right now. But that word belongs in here because it was stated and said, and we are not censoring other areas. And I totally object to this. Jennifer and then Shalini and then Pam. I'm going yeah. in order of hands, so. Yeah, I'll take mine down and put it back up again. So I actually asked Shalini, you know, because I was interested to know how many surveys use the word discriminate, discrimination, and I one used it. So, and a lot, others said unfair. So we have to choose something. I think that, I don't think it's discrimination. Um, I think that we, that, you know, and you may disagree, like I don't, if we had, if we put the limit at six or eight or 14, or then- I'm not talking about changing the limit. That's a fear tactic. Right. No, 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 I know. Okay, but I'm just saying one survey used it and more used the word unfair. So I think, and I do think it's a very inflammatory word. I don't think, it, I think discrimination- It makes you uncomfortable. No, so I, I think, I think- Pat, I, let Jennifer I, finish. I think I'm sorry, no, Jennifer, I apologize. Way more egregious than a, than a limit on a number of roommates. But we, we, we were picking language out of the survey. There, there's, you know, 300 and something different surveys. So I'm saying, of all, I think that it is, um, there's a certain, you know, why would we pick that word when other people said they thought it was unfair or they, you know, one person said they thought it was outdated. I just, don't think we have to use, we have to, we're, we're, we're making a choice because only one survey used that word out of 357. So I'm saying, I don't feel comfortable using that word. You know, there, I, you know, and there was, there were some surveys that actually picked out particular landlords by name and said very disparaging things about them, but we, you know, didn't put that in the report for, you know, 
so we're, we've made decisions throughout the report of how, you know, what and what quotes we're going to use from the different reports. But I think since one survey used the word discrimination and it's, I don't actually think it applies. And, and the, I think there were nine tenant surveys where they expressed a concern about this um, limit and that the word unfair was used more than the one time discrimination was used. So that's, that's just my, that's my suggestion. Thank you, Jennifer. Shalini. Yes, so um, that is true that only one of the 11, 10 people or 11 people, uh, tenants used the word discrimi um, discriminatory and it was used. Uh, and so I think it's for the group to decide, but generally in qualitative research, what is done is you draw out the sentiments and but not necessarily respect to, uh, there was a lot of stuff said about affordable housing. It's just not fair, it's not uh, accessible and not not just about the four tenant, but just overall the theme around tenants was the objection to the rules that are in place that are making um, housing unaffordable for them. So anyway, all this to say that this is a, you know, it's a, it, there's no, there's no absolute science, there is a science to it, but there's, uh, it's what we decide to put in. There's no real, it's not, it's a gray area here. So uh, one student used discriminatory, they, they did say the words, it's against students, so I'm assuming it's students. But I think it's, for us, it's important to communicate, we're not agreeing here with what they're saying, we just want to be true to the essence of what these community members are trying to get through. So whether we agree with them or not, I think the important thing in the report is that are we able to accurately reflect the sentiment and experience, lived experiences of these different stakeholders uh, in our community? And the better we are able to hear the different points of view, whether we agree or not, is not, uh, you know, we all agree, but that's not what we're talking about. The more, the better we can listen to people the better solutions we can then come up with. So I think in that sense, um, I think Pat has a good point that by putting that point, it is kind of on the face kind of, and it makes us look at it more seriously, whether we agree or not. And then on the other hand, I agree with Jennifer that more people use the word unfair. So, um, really it's up to us as a community, you know, as a committee and I think it is a serious issue uh, that exists in our community about not just this, but just about later on tenants saying that they feel like second class citizens, they don't feel like have, they ha don't have a sense of belonging. And so so all of this do, yeah, I don't know. So I'm okay, I'm okay with either way, as long as we are reflecting the fact that um, tenants are not, don't feel good about the existing rules, so. Thank you, Shalini. Pam. I think the, um, if, if the statement said one, one tenant described it as being discriminatory against students, mm -hmm. that's an accurate capture of, of that sentiment. Right. I, I think um, Jennifer's statement of unfair seems to capture the the sentiment um, much much more broadly than the one comment about discriminatory and the point that I was trying to make before is that a four person the four person cap is as if they want to call it that is as discriminatory against working people who want to live together as it is for students who want to live together. So I feel very uncomfortable using the word discrim discriminatory against students because in fact, it is not against students. It is against anyone living in the town of Amherst. And that's, that's, that's it's not related. Unrelated. Thank you. And so I would, I, I like the word unfair. That's, that's a, it captures that concern but it doesn't use the word improperly, and it doesn't and it doesn't show that it's just one comment. So I'd I'd be happy to support this as as typed in. 
Shalini? Yeah, I think I would agree with the fact that uh, seeing some of the tenants described it as being, then that's actually not accurate. So it would be more accurate to say some of them, like if you're talking about as an over, overall sentiment, it's around unfairness. And out of that, one of them did use the specific word. So I'm okay with unfair. And again, the the reason why we should change it is because that's more accurate to the data, but not because we think that this is an inaccurate statement for the people to make, you know, whether it's discriminatory or not to the working people or this people or that, that's not what we're doing here. So that is our personal opinion. Um, I'll, I'll make a statement that having heard from Shalini that more people described, used the word unfair than used the word discriminatory. And given how this sentence is written, that I would, if there was a motion on the floor, I would vote to accept the motion for the change. Um, I have heard three other members do so. I am happy to, if the committee wants to do a vote or wants that recorded, or if any one person on the committee wants such a vote recorded to do that motion. Otherwise, um, if we know the outcome and there's no desire from any one member to have it recorded, then we will just leave it like this and do a final vote. But if any I member- I would like to have a vote. Okay. Then um, I will, uh, Jennifer, do you want to make the motion in this section since it was your requested change? Um, yes, I would like to make a motion that um, in section five of the executive summary, um, the second paragraph under negative consequences for tenants that the word discriminatory against be um, replaced by the words unfair. It's four, right? Yeah. yeah. That's my motion. Second that, Shalini. Shalini seconded that. Is there any other discussion on that motion? Seeing none, we will take a vote. We will start with Shalini. Yes. Pat. No. Mandy is an aye. Pam. Aye. And Jennifer. Aye. That is a four in favor, one opposed. The motion passes to make that change. Are there any other requested changes um, to this document before we put a motion on the floor? Um. Yes, Jennifer. Yeah, so the date says it, it'll be today's date and where we can have anything saying, you know, this is the final or we had discussed that. Um, let, get, let me type up this motion first. Okay. So I can make my notes and then I'll page up to that. Um, so that's why I left that part um, in tracked changes because I wasn't sure how we were doing that. So I, I tracked the deletion of the draft word draft everywhere so that people could see we're still sort of in draft until we get there. Um, um, and, and that was sort of how I thought it might work. Um, oh, I thought I lost. No, I just haven't. Okay. okay. So, um, can I, oh, okay. So you can't read anything here, but you can at least see what it looks like. Um, oh, I missed one draft in a, in a footer or not somewhere. Okay, so it would say here, community engagement report adopted by CRC, and then I'd put the date in. Um, is that enough with the removal of draft everywhere? Or um, 
would we want to replace in the footers draft with final or adopted or is there other ways people would like to do it? Pam? I think just taking the word draft out should be fine. And then adding in the adopted. Yeah, on the on the cover. And again, and, yeah. and again, thanks. Thanks to Shalini and Elena or Elena. I don't remember how her name is pronounced, but this is a lot of work. Yeah. 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 Any other changes? Seeing none, I'll make the motion to adopt the Amherst Rental Survey Community Engagement Report as amended at the April 27th, 2023 meeting. Is there a second? Second. Pam seconds it. Um, any further discussion? I would like to say one thing beyond the thank you that Pam already offered to both Shalini and Elena. Um, I know for some members of this committee, it was a very frustrating process, if not for all of us. <laughs> it might be some, it might be all. Um, but I, I think it was a valuable process and I don't know what this vote will be. Um, if it is unanimous, I you know I don't know what it'll be, but I think whatever it is might be better than if we had not went through this this way and just the way we were able to work through a number of the concerns um, I think was very valuable and worthy of this committee. Um, so I just want to thank all the members, not even knowing how people are going to vote. <laughs> I just wanted to say that, that it took us a we while. We something together. <laughs> but I think we we took something that I believe the first draft was not well liked by a, a few of our members and, for, you know, if not more than a majority, who knows? And we've gotten to a point where I think we may be close to or yet unanimous and it took a while, but I think it's been a good process for that, no matter how frustrating it's been for a number of us. So yay committee is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Pam. Are you going to type in today's date in the, on the cover? Oh, here, I can do that now if you want. Oh, wait, no, it's not the 26th. So I don't even know what date it is. <laughs> Any other comments, discussion? You need a gap between the comma and the 2023. It's been added even though I stopped the share before I did that. Thank you. Anything else? We are off to a vote. Uh, we start with Pat. Uh, thanks, Shalane and Elena, and thank the committee, but I cannot vote for this. No. Um, Mandy is an aye. Pam? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. And Shalini? Yes. Pat, um, I always offer the opportunity as I will write a report on this. Um, if you would like to, uh, <clears throat> if you want to say anything now or later as I write no, a report. No, I've said what I had to say many okay. times. <laughs> Got it. Okay. I always offer the opportunity. I know. So. Thank you. With that, let me let me find my, my agenda. Um, we don't have time for zoning priorities and housing today, <laughs> but we kind of covered some of it sort of during the hearing. They kind of sometimes mix, but we don't have time for that today. So we're not doing that. I need to do general public comment. Um, and I see Shalini's hand is up. Shalini. I did have a, I have to leave. So yes. I'm glad this would happen. And uh, Pat, if you wanted to write back to me about, because I am thinking about how to, no, no, not about this issue, but moving forward, 
how do we do community engagement process because I thought it was a very valuable process to listen to so many different voices. So how can we improve on the process to have to work together as a committee and any other and everyone actually what improvements uh, can we do because it's just the first time. So what improvements and how to make it easier, more efficient for and more inclusive the whole process. I would love any feedback. Thank you. Thank you. So we are now opening to general public comment. These are public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC. You are welcome to respect, uh, respect. welcome to express your views for up to three minutes. Um, please, if you'd like to make a public comment right now, please raise your hand and we will recognize you in turn. I see one hand, Janet Keller, please unmute yourself and state your name where you live and make your comment. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of you um, for the rigor of your discussion and um, the uh, care that you took with it and the opportunity to comment. Um, thank you. Thank you, Janet. I see no other hands, so general public comment is now closed. Um, next agenda. Uh, we've got a hearing and hopefully we're going to have legal review back and Board of License Commissioner thoughts back on the regulations um, for residential permitting and all. Um, so those would be the main items on the agenda at this point. Um, it may change depending on what I hear. We'll also keep the, you'll see Planning Board and ZVA appointments on there regularly for whatever steps we need to go through. We might have more than just sufficiency of applicant pool on the next agenda, including interview questions. Um, and the um, selection criteria, because um, we're getting to the point where we're gonna have to do those and have them ready for whenever we might determine the pool sufficient. Um, so those might end on there, even if we haven't determined the pool sufficient at that point. So that's it for me on previews. Pam. One last question on that. In these communications with folks that are already sitting members, um, is there, can I give a time frame that we're, that we're expecting that we would do interviews in May or something early May? So I would say late May. We can't do interviews until we've sufficiently the pool and we can't do that at least till May 11th. Um, you know, I, I'm looking up a calendar now. The goal is, where's my calendar? Um, we have to act on something by June 30 because terms expire July, June 30. And so there's a council meeting June 26th. So I think that's the meeting, frankly, we're aiming for. Um, in terms of getting it to the council. So interviews probably late May, early June, no later than mid-June because we need to do them by mid-June. Um, no matter what we think of the sufficiency of the pool in some sense, we have to make that decision, but um, late May, early June. Thank you. Any other questions, agendas? Items not anticipated by myself. I have none. Does anyone else have anything? Seeing none, I'm adjourning the meeting at 6.34 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you, Dave, for sticking it out. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. And thank you, Athena.